What do Earth and a kid who brings their dog's ashes to show and tell have in common? We're both incredibly lonely. Even though we try to act cool about it, humans are desperate for an extraterrestrial BFF. Lions, tigers, and blobfish are neat and all. But we're looking for another species with complex intelligence that we can learn from and do fun stuff with. Like make intergalactic friendship bracelets or go to war with. Humans love going to war and we can't do that with a blobfish. We'd get all sticky. We know extraterrestrial life is out there. Our almighty statistics tell us so. In the vastness of our ever-expanding universe, the probability that we are alone is slimmer than a shady. The Drake Equation suggests that as long as 1% of advanced civilizations can overcome a global extinction brought about by themselves and their technology, then we have millions of extraterrestrial neighbors only a few hundred light years away. We'd like to think that we are just now advancing to the point where we can find our new space besties, who also haven't found us yet. The alternative is that they'll know we're here and are treating us like the kid who no one wants to sit next to at lunch. Because while everyone is enjoying their sloppy joes and gogurt, we're busy chowing down on a glue stick. No one wants to be the paste kid. But let's say in this scenario, we aren't a glue-obsessed youngster that no one wants to talk to. And it's up to us to go out and make friends. To find them, we'll need to find a habitable zone that is just right for life as we know it. To start, we need to follow the advice of acclaimed NASA researcher, Shang Damago Goldman, who states, to search for life anywhere, we have this follow the water approach. Anywhere you find water on Earth, you find life. Whether it's life on Mars, ocean worlds, or exoplanets, water is the first signpost we're looking for. And lucky for us, we don't have to travel hundreds of light years away to find a water world. We have one right down the street in our very own solar system. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth largest moon, and number one in our hearts. Yeah, we know it's unfair that Saturn gets to have those giant rings and 82 moons. But we have the blobfish, so who's really winning? Enceladus, like the rest of the first seven of Saturn's satellites, gets its name from giants in Greek mythology. According to the myth, Enceladus is the offspring of the Earth and Uranus. Enceladus was first discovered in 1789 by British astronomer William Herschel or anyone before that looked up and said, well, that one's bright. And those accidental astronomers were spot on with their observation, because Enceladus is the whitest, most reflective surface in the solar system. For decades, scientists didn't know why Enceladus was so bright, and without knowing that liquid water could exist that far into our solar system, it went ignored. This changed in 2004, when the Cassini space probe began orbiting Saturn, and discovered a strange occurrence in the planet's magnetic field, near its sixth largest moon. In a targeted flyby, Cassini found four massive fissures centered on Enceladus's south pole. Plumes of water vapor and ice grains gushed from cracks on the moon's surface, revealing that Enceladus was active. Camera imaging in 2005 provided more details that the south polar region was a youthful and complex terrain with water jets continuously erupting at 800 miles per hour. A fraction of the material from the eruptions makes their way to Saturn's E-ring, while the rest fall back down like snow, giving the moon its bright white surface. A surface that at first glance would look like a dream come true for Scarface or college seniors at their last frat party. Samples taken from the plume during a close flyby in 2008 detected a mix of volatile gases water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other organic materials. The components for life were found, and with measurements based on the Doppler effect and a slight wobble in the moon's orbit, below the cracks, we discovered an underground global ocean, possibly capable of housing life. With its active ocean, Enceladus possesses the three building blocks for life as we know it, water, chemistry, and energy. Water from the ocean, chemistry in the organic compounds found in plume, and energy from hydrothermal vents we expect to be present at the sea floor. If you say nah uh to the last one because we haven't seen them yet, then how do you explain the methane found in the samples that are a key product of hydrothermal systems? Come on, tell us, science brain know-it-all.
Oh, you can't? Ha! <laughs> nice try. Point us. Watch some more Bill Nye reruns and come back when you're ready for an actual fight. So, if all the ingredients of life are currently cooking in a Saturn moon stew, is our search for friendly neighborhood E.T. finally over? Well, we're not sure. Though the promise for discovering extraterrestrial life is at the highest it's ever been, and we can theorize that some sort of life spends its days swimming around in Enceladus's ocean, until we look in, we can't know for sure. And if there is life on Enceladus, we don't know where it's at in its evolutionary stage. Could it be similar to microbes that first inhabited Earth's oceans billions of years ago? Or is it a world of creepy fish similar to the ones that reside in our deepest and darkest parts of the ocean that light doesn't reach? Perhaps the opposite is true and complex intelligent life has evolved in the billions of years of Enceladus's existence. Maybe a species like the anglerfish evolved to the top of the food chain with its illuminating light. And there is a civilization of anglers in the depths of Enceladus. But like if the creature from the Black Lagoon got it on with Mrs. Puff, the angler army might have homes, cities, and cultures that resemble Tim Burton's reimagining of Atlantis. Or perhaps it isn't at all civilization. It could be one big fish, like a really, really big fish that evolved in a way that we don't understand because the underwater world is a bit too different from our own. Or maybe there's nothing. Maybe Enceladus's ocean is completely free of life and is just some really cold water. Maybe Earth truly is just right and we have evolved as we are from a missing link we don't quite know yet. We won't know until we find out. And when attempting to, we have to remember to be cautious. Just because we do a great job of tearing up our environment, it doesn't mean we can be reckless and end up tearing up somebody else's home. But let's say there is complex intelligent life in the oceans of Enceladus, and we want to make them our cosmic companion. As humans, we might think that we're the best fit in making the connection, but we'd like to present a case for us to take a step back for once and let our guild guys and gals take the lead. After all, didn't Carl Sagan say, the best way to communicate with an alien fish is with our own fish. <laughs>